now that we're recording. So I'm going to talk about some uh, methods for statistical harmonization. Um, and again, we're going, to, we're going to discuss what is harmonization, what are our goals ultimately. We want to keep our, our ultimate goals in mind. We'll talk about harmonization using latent variables and without latent variables. And then we'll, um, if we've got time, we'll briefly cover some general issues, a.k.a. questions that um, Jennifer Manley and Laura Zahadny have asked. Um, that that, uh, that uh, this presentation does not answer yet. Um, so harmonization is a really broad term. It can be referred to actions and procedures that you do at the level of study design. Like you can, at the level, HCAP is a beautiful example of this. So at the level of study design, um, you know, different investigators are going into the field and agreeing, we're going to try to find tests that, are, that we could administer in common across our different contexts. Um, you can do qualitative assessments about the comparability of, of measurements without doing a data analysis. And then there are statistical approaches to link measurement scales and tests. And um, I'm going to focus on those, these statistical approaches for linking data that you have. So harmonization can help us synthesize um, information across different sources, um, either to have bigger samples or to address novel questions. And these bigger sources can be... Um, um, different studies in different countries or different cohorts, or they can be different time points within a study. If, say, um, for example, the, the cognitive tests change over time in a study. Um, so what, what is our goal? Ultimately, our goal is to compare cognitive performance across studies or time when potential test items differ. And to meet this goal, goal, as Emily um, described in our to lump or to split um, discussion, we either need to assume that we have at least some common items or we need to um, uh, believe that we have exchangeable people with respect to cognition. In other words, we would love to match on cognitive functioning of the people who are taking our tasks. Because that's really hard, we often focus on the common item approach. But this is another um, option available to us. So, um, you know, Emily did a really great job of talking about pre-statistical harmonization. It's really an accounting job, and it's a lot of fun where you gather all the, not just the test data, but all the descriptive information about the test and the test characteristics, and you want to understand, the, the, in, in addition, the characteristics of the cohorts. Um, and then, then we do, as, as Rich mentioned, the easy part. We do our statistical harmonization approaches for test equating. And... Um, as part of pre-statistical harmonization that I'll talk about, um, we find certain items that we, that we believe are, are comparable enough. For example, digit symbol substitution using waste three versus waste R. It's measuring a similar enough construct. The absolute numbers are different, so the scale differs. But maybe we can stretch or constrain distributions to make these items appear common for our purposes. So um, at our analogy here that, that we've come to, to be fond of is the Procrustean bed. So in, as part of our sort of pre-statistical harmonization and searching out um, um, adequate adequacy of items, again, we're working closely between um, your, your psychometricians and your neuropsychologists and people who actually administer these tests. So in, in Greek mythology, Procrustes was an innkeeper, and he had a bed, and it was one size fits all. And if you were too short for this bed, he stretched you out until you fit the bed. And if you were too long for the bed, if your arms or legs um, um, hung off, that's fine. He'll just cut off your legs. And it'll be, it'll, it'll be great. Um, yeah, so that's and it, kind of what we're doing. But um, so let's talk about approaches, approaches for harmonization. So um, we, this is sort of a decision tree to help you. If you start at the um, left, do you have individual respondent and item level data from a large sample? If you don't, then you might want to apply some linear or mean equating, like a z-score approach or something like that. And it's, 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 it's not necessarily harmonizing or equating. Um, it's, it's more uh, just linking of scales. But if you, if you can say yes to whether you have individual respondent and item level data from a large sample, do you have enough data that supports a measurement model? And if that's true, and if you have a small enough number of samples to be linked, I don't know what small means, maybe less than 50. 
then you can do structural equation modeling or constraint factor analysis or item response theory. These are all different words for a similar set of um, enterprises that, that we're going to talk about here. And if you have a gigantic number of samples to be equated, there's another approach um, in that, uh, that, uh, that M plus software has um, developed for us back in 2014 called alignment analysis. I'm not going to talk about that too much here. But yeah. And if you have item level data, but you can't, but you, but it's not, but there are not enough items to support a measurement model for a factor analysis, you can, there are a number of um, non-latent variable based methods such as different equating methods, um, such as equipercentile or mean or linear equating. So I'm going to group these two things broadly into item-based and distribution-based standardization methods. So the goal of item-based um, harmonization is to define, a to define a transformation of a test that places it on the same metric as um, another. And we use multiple different test items um, and, and, and indicators for that. And um, um, our example there is item response theory. So I'm going to go over that um, for, for a little bit. So in item response theory, we've got a latent variable F in a circle here and observed indicators, which I've called U1, U2, and U3. The observed indicators are the, the cognitive test indicators that we observe that are derived from the response um, data that was administered to people in a study. And this latent variable represents the common, covariabi common covariability among um, the, these different indicators. And um, um, the, way that the, the way that the empirical model describes this, this probabilistic relationship between the latent variable and the indicators is through s a series of different parameters. Namely, um, we've got the, uh, the, 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 the actual relationship on these arrows is modeled between the F and the U's, is modeled as a measurement slope or an A parameter, um, or a, it's called a lambda. And also every indicator also has a, an item threshold or, or, a, or a mean uh, or an intercept. And there's also a residual variance. There's unexplained variability in these indicators. Um, so extra, ex, this, in this residual variability in the indicators is not being shared um, with any of the other indicators in the model. Um, just a quick note here. Um, you know, obviously in, in the real world when we're in these boxes, we have actual um, scales, like you know, a 10-word list is, is you can have scores on a 0 to 10 scale. In latent variable space, there is no natural scale. By convention, we tend to um, scale our latent variable to have a mean of 0 and a variance of 1. And there's a little more footwork that we do when we use our latent variable methods for harmonization approaches, just to give you a preview. I want to talk about some terminology here because I think it'll really help um, both in this talk and in moving forward as we, as we have conversations and discuss our different approaches. So um, let's talk about our, con our um, target of measurement. Our target of measurement ultimately is a construct that we want to represent. We want to represent cognitive functioning or maybe we want to represent you know, um, speed of cognitive processing or memory or some other subdomain thereof. Um, so this construct is a theoretical attribute. An operationalization in a statistical model of our construct is a latent variable. And then indexes are um, different. Well, they're still, they're still um, a, it's, it's like a composite score, but the indicators syn syntactically cause the construct of interest. Whereas you'll notice the way that we've drawn our, our factor here, the underlying um, latent variable is causally related to covariation in the observed indicators. Okay, now let's talk about items and indicators. I'm drawing this terminology from a, from a neat book, uh, Frontiers of Test Validity by Marcus and Boersboom. This is the same Denny Boersboom that, uh, that wrote um, uh, Measuring the Mind, and I'm a really big fan. He's really cool. Um, he, has, he, has, he has a band. He's a member of a, of a local band in Denmark. Some of us will never accomplish. So anyway, <laughs> items. The I, so when, 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 when I talk about an item, and I'm trying to be better about this in my own work, when I talk about an item, that's really the stimulus designed to 
get a, to elicit a response. Like, I'm going to administer a serial sevens task where I ask the person, start with 100 and subtract off seven. The item response is the person's actual response to the item. So the person might respond, okay, 93, 87, 80, 73, and 85. Those are the, those, those are the item responses. Now, those item responses are ne not necessarily something that you can put into an item score and correlate with other things. We might want to code the correct number of s correct um, subtractions that this person has done. So maybe that's the item score. But you know, we may, we may find that this item score is either horribly um, distributed or, um, 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 or there, there's other issues with it. So um, we, for, we may further transform that score. Or it's, it's either horribly um, 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 skewed and it, or it's, it's, it's not exactly equivalent across data sets. So we may transform the item score to an indicator. The indicator is the representation of the item response in a, in, a, in a model that we've got. So the indicator is the item used in models. It, it can be a recoded item score. Sometimes it is the item score. For example, um, I may, for serial sevens, I may choose a score of three, or I may recode uh, a one as um, completely correct, and a zero if you've made any mistake on the serial sevens, um, depending. There, in neuropsychology, there's lots of examples with, with wordless learning tasks. For example, if you've got a 10-word uh, list, you could have 10 different indicators for um, each word, correct or incorrect. You can have a sum of, of the, of, of the uh, number correct. Um, and there are a number of other things. This is an example of constructional praxis from the Lassie Dodd study. So um, there's a, um, one, one, of the, one of the items, participants were asked to draw a diamond. And so in the, in the item coding in the data set was 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. But when, when we looked at the distributions, um, there's not an even gradient. There's not a, there's not, it's not like you have um, you know, a, small, a large number of people um, doing well and performing on a 3, and then a slightly smaller number doing a 2, and then a 1, and then a 0. You've got a bolus of people at 0, and then a bolus of people at 3. And so um, I've described what you have to do to get these scores. So a three, you draw four sides, and the lines are enclosed, and the lines are of approximately equal length. And then a one and a two, you're drawing, a f you're drawing four sides, but maybe the sides are, unequal, are of unequal length, or maybe you've not um, closed all the angles um, appropriately to within an eighth of an inch. And a zero is you didn't draw four sides. When I think about this as an indicator that I want to put in my IRT model, to me, a 0, 1, and a 2 represents different ways of having an incorrect um, 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 response. And for a neuropsychologist interested in maybe a differential diagnosis, maybe the distinction between a 1 and a 2 could be useful. If I'm trying to represent con cognitive performance on a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a latent continuum, I'm not sure that I that I under that I that I can appreciate the distinction between the distinction between a zero, a one, and a two. To me, I'm going to recode this as an indicator. These are all different flavors of mistakes and errors. Let's move on. So, um, broadly speaking, our steps in harmonization is to identify all the items across the studies, identify potentially common items to serve as anchor items. Um, so when, when we're constructing a latent variable um, model, um, when, you know, heuristically, as you can imagine, when you, when you want to link cognition across um, different study sources or different time points, you need at least some common items. We can leverage common and unique items across, across the entire um, neuropsych batteries, but we need ideally something in common. And if we don't have an easy answer to what is, um, what is in common, we have to make different levels of assumptions. And we have to become, unfor uh, unfortunately or fortunately, we have to become, we have to, we have to recognize those assumptions that, that we make. Um, the, um, this is kind of an open area for, for um, debate and discussion, and maybe our simulation group can, uh, can think about this at least. But um, um, the best indicators are often highly correlated, those indicators that are highly correlated with other tests in each study and have sort of an average difficulty level. They're not necessarily extremely easy items like 
digit span back, uh, forwards, or they're not extremely difficult tasks for, for, for a sample. And then we convert all the items into indicators as necessary. So what could our, at this point, what, what would our data structure look like? Let's say that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to um, try to harmonize the different um, 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 HCAP studies that we have um, this week um, at, at the conference. So I've got um, an example cut of data. So the Lossy study, let's say that it, the Lossy study administered indicators U1 and U3 and U4. So we have data from three um, um, from three indicators for the, lot, for the lossy participants. Maybe the MEXCOG study also administered uh, three tasks that we're going to use going forward, um, but um, um, they did not administer U2, they administered, um, or they did not administer a U3 like lossy did, they administered a U2 that lossy did not administer. And then HRS HCAP also administered three tasks, um, and their battery was the same as MEXCOG. There's no overlap between, um, there's no pairwise overlap between U2 and U3, so we cannot form a covariance matrix, but there's overlap between U1 and U2 and U1 and U3, and also U4 and U2, U4 and U3. So we can construct a covariance uh, matrix and um, if we wanted to do this, and there, but there's also an item banking approach where we can handle these things in a stepwise manner um, that, 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 that I'll talk about. But, um, con but conceptu conceptually speaking, if you're, if you're a visual learner, this is kind of what our data can look like. And you might have a question about whether is U2, is U2 really, really the same between MEXCOG and HRS HCAP? Or are there differences due to culture, as Shelley um, asked, or study design or something? That's a question that we can ask. At, uh, again, it's an iterative process. That's a question that we can ask sort of um, later on. We can, we can see whether these items are functioning the same or differently um, across the different um, studies. That's a question of measurement non-invariance or differential item functioning. Our work group two is going to um, focus on that. But for now, you know, our, our initial step is to get a model that, that, that works across these studies. So um, after, we've, after we've built our, built our indicators and put them into our data set, um, we estimate an IRT model in each, we, we, we can estimate an IRT model in each sample separately. The first time um, in your first reference um, sample, let's say, we freely estimate all the parameters in the first reference sample, fixing only the mean and the variance of, of your, in your, in your um, IRT model um, at, at the outset. And so this first reference sample, it's kind of like the, the, the scaling sample. Every other data set is ultimately gonna be scaled to this um, sample. And again, as I mentioned earlier, in latent variable space, there's no natural scaling, so we've got to pick something. Um, and we can, we can have conversations about what is that reference that we, that we do pick. Um, so in later samples, you restrict the, the parameters for items that you've seen before to what they were in the previous samples. And you free the mean and variance because now in, the, in, this, in this next sample, um, I'm, I'm assuming that I'm estimating cognitive performance using the available tests that I've got. Um, and this estimate of cognitive performance is on the same metric as that um, reference data set. As an example, if let's say I chose the lossy dad as my, as my reference um, study. So I'm going to estimate parameters for items U1, U3, and U4. And again, by parameters, I'm talking about the factor loadings and the item thresholds and the residual um, variances of these, of these items. So I estimate pr these parameters for items U1, U3, and U4, not for U2 because it doesn't exist in Lossy. But in MEXCOG, I'm going e to estimate an IRT model in MEXCOG. I'm going to constrain the pr relevant parameters for U1 and U and U4 to what they were in Lossy, but I'm going to freely estimate um, U2's parameters, and they should they should um, be they should fall in line to to to, to, to um, what to the scale of the Lossy data because we're, we've got some parameters from Lossy that we're fixing within MexCog, and so on and so forth. Ultimately, the final model should not estimate. Uh, 
Ah, yeah, the final model d does not estimate a score and parameters simultaneously. By that I mean all parameters have to be fixed to something um, all to something previously. So your final scoring model should have zero parameters estimated um, because they were all estimated in some population of interest earlier. And again, if you're concerned about items that function differently by study, we save that for diff testing um, later on. And there are empirical ways to, to look at that. So this is a graphical um, description of that procedure as, as we've implemented it in the pitch project that um, Rich is going to talk about um, um, in, when we talk about specific data sets. Um, we chose as the reference study the HRS CODA sample, which CODA stands for Child, Children of the Depression. It was collected in 1998. There's a whole bunch of reasons why we chose that particular data set. We did the item harmonization, which was recoding um, from item scores to indicators, and um, um, we defined that. We, we developed a harmonized um, set of items, and then we, developed, we did an IRT um, calibration. Basically, we estimated the IRT model and saved out relevant parameters. We stored all of these parameters in an item bank. And then um, up at the top right here, we have other data. Other data can include other waves of the HRS. Other data can, can include other, other studies um, uh, within the international um, um, sister studies. And we go through um, similar procedures. And we're, we're building this item bank. And ultimately, we estimate our latent trait, and we have our equated latent trait data. And so that's the, that's the, that's, those are the procedures that, um, that were implemented in the pitch project. Oops. So this is example syntax for M+. Um, you know, in step one, you, let's say that we've got our reference sample, um, which was HRS CODA. We estimate our, we're going to estimate a model. So our latent variable, I'm calling it GCP, and it's measured by a bunch of indicators. And since this is our reference sample, we don't have, we haven't, there's nothing in our item bank yet. We're freely estimating our loadings, and the thresholds are also um, going to be estimated. And we're fixing our variance of 1 and, a, and, a, and, a, and our mean of our latent variable to 0. And then step 2, or really step x plus 1, because um, we're, we're doing this for every subsequent sample, where we're fixing, um, say, let's say that u1 and u2 and u17 were, were observed um, um, in, in earlier, but um, you know, U3 to U16, um, th those have not been observed. So maybe we're going to freely estimate those. But because we're fixing variances and uh, because we're fixing loadings and because I'm not showing you here, but we're also fixing um, thresholds for, for various indicators to be what they were in previous data sets, we can, for, for identifiability um, and for scaling purposes, we can free the variance and the mean of the GCP. When in M plus um, syntax, when, you, when you've got a, um, brackets around a latent variable, you're referring to the mean structure. And when you don't have brackets, you're referring to the variances or residual variances, what have you. So um, you know, um, what happens if we were to pool the samples, whether they're studies or time points, and run a single IRT model all, all in one big shebang. The item parameters in that case would reflect kind of an average between the characteristics of all the samples. So the larger of the samples would contribute more to the co-calibration, and um, it's difficult to really define what is, what's a zero point. What do, what do these, what do these um, values actually mean, since it's sort of a jumble of, of all the different studies. We avoid that by using this stepwise item banking approach. So what are some issues with harmonization using IRT? I'm going to talk about three issues now. I'm going to talk about so your selection of your estimator and um, checking for differential precision or ceiling and floor effects. And I'm going to talk about um, the, the metric across studies. Tim. So just going back to that. Let's talk about selecting an estimator. Broadly, using, um, using um, our softwares, whether it's M plus or whatever other software, there's three estimators that, that I'll talk about that most everybody uses. There's your WLSMV estimator. 
The WLSMV weighted least squares estimator works from the observed covariance matrix of indicators. Thus, it relies on pairwise complete um, data. So if I'm using Paul's approach and I'm combining, say, two studies into my, as, as my reference source, and these two studies, data set A and data set B, look like this, there's no pairwise overlap between, for indicators um, one and indicator seven between the two data sets. So that model wouldn't converge. So, um, so you couldn't use a WLSMV estimator for that approach. You would use an MLR or a Bayesian estimator. But um, um, so the, um, another issue to, to keep in mind is, again, as a result of a WLSMV estimator using pairwise complete data, um, the, your missing data assumption is that data are missing completely at random. And sometimes that's not entirely um, viable. And you want to use analysis equals parameterization equals theta and so that you can match your parameter estimates on, to be on the same scale as estimates from a Bayesian or an MLR estimator. It's a small detail, but it's all in the details. If you use an, a, a maximum likelihood estimator, all records are used, not just a summary covariance matrix. So the MLR estimator um, cannot will not necessarily, th there can be a hole in the, in the covariance coverage between indicator one an indicator six, let's say, but indicator eight cannot be used um, initially in, when, when you're only considering data sets A and data set B because none of the studies administered indicator eight. Yeah, okay. So Bayesian estimator. We can use a Bayesian estimator and get it Bayesian plausible values. This is um, a, a slightly different flavor of, um, uh, of, um, of um, estimation based on a WLSMV and um, um, MLR. And it's basically based on plausible values drawn from a posterior distribution. And I can ask for uh, 100 or 30 draws from this posterior. I can average across all these different draws. Um, and there's a little more um, noise that gets added into plausible values such that if your goal is to simply estimate population parameters and do epidemiological inference, plausible values may be desirable because they retain some imprecision. Whereas if I'm using WLSMV or MLR, just um, let's assume that I've estimated factor scores. There's a, there's a unique factor score I'm using WLSMV and MLR for every possible response pattern. Whereas for a Bayesian plausible value, because I'm averaging across these random plucks from the posterior distribution, if, if I have two people with the exact same profile of, of indicator responses, it's possible that they, have, they, they may have very slightly different um, um, factor scores or um, um, plausible values. Not considerably different, but um, within, within a couple, they'll be within several decimal places. So you want to check for another issue um, that comes up is we want to check for differential um, precision across studies. And um, we often see this most obviously when, when we look at floor and ceiling effects. So the example here comes from the ERIC study, which has um, three visits. And at their visits, what we'll call visit two and visit four, when these people were in middle age, Cognition was not that important of a construct to assess. This study was interested in atherosclerotic risk. By the time we got to visit five, about 20 odd years later, these guys are on average in their late 60s and 70s. You bet we want to ask lots more questions about cognition. So we want to leverage all the available information. So we did a harmonize, uh, we, we, we derived harmonized scores for visit two cognitive performance, visit four, and visit five cognitive performance. We had three common items linking a delayed word recall task, a digit symbol substitution, and a word um, fluency task. Um, so we can, we, can, we can put all these scores on the same metric, but as you can imagine at visit five, there's a lot more information um, that's available to us here. So there's gonna be a lot more spread. And this is looking at just a memory factor score. So using memory items, which is um, the, the three items at the bottom here, an incidental learning, um, a logical memory, and the, this delayed word recall task. The scores are really crunched up here because we only had one indicator, the delayed word recall at visit two and visit four, but then we had a lot more spread and a lot more room for people to go down at, at, the, at the fifth visit. And what we noticed is um, these dropped floors can cause biases. If you're looking at associations, or if you're looking at um, 
mean rates of change, or if you're even looking at associations of a predictor with cognitive change, um, you can get biased results if people with low levels of the exposure, such as physical activity or education, also have low cognition at baseline. So um, it's, it's, our, it's our problem of things correlated with baseline can, can um, induce um, problems. If once, I, wa I, I want to I make this point. So if one sample, more broadly speaking, if one sample does not have all the items with parameters at extreme ends of the scale, either, the, either, either, either parameters with um, very large thresholds or very um, um, low thresholds, then people in that sample cannot score as low or as high as people from another sample for whom a different battery was administered. So um, this is also a problem when you, when you have many fewer items that w w whose thresholds lie within um, a, a given range um, with it not, that are not at the extremes, but you don't necessarily notice it. Um, but this comes through with um, less precision of your, of, your, of your resulting score. And um, the third challenge is the metric, um, the, the, the same across studies. So ideally, we want um, cognition, to, uh, we want indicators to measure the latent trait in the same way among different subgroups of a population, whether that be um, study membership, um, country, age, race, sex, to the extent that indicators do not measure um, the latent trait th in, in the same way, we say that the items show differential item functioning. And again, that's a work group two topic that work group one can also approach, and we're going to have a fun time with that. So briefly, I want to talk about distribution-based um, approaches for, for harmonization. So I've talked about this box up here, and I'm going to cover this long after I've, I've been told to stop. But it's OK. So mean equating. You basically, um, you basically subtract off the mean of a new score in order to equate the means. It's very basic, and you can, you can, you can um, derive scores that, that have extreme values. Linear equating, you make the means and the standard deviations the same. If, you're, if you've ever done a z-score, um, if you've ever z-scored different variables, this is, that's an example of linear equating. Equipercentile equating leverages not only the means and the standard deviations, but also individual percentiles. So if I've got what looks like a bimodal distribution up here, I can, I can say that, okay, this is at the ninth uh, percentile, and this score is also at the ninth percentile. So these scores that have the same percentiles, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to um, fix them to have the same scores in my equipercentile equated score. Um, I won't go through that. There's, um, it's, it's algebra, it's pretty easy algebra for how these things are done. There's an R package for echo percentile equating. Um, this is an example from, from uh, the active study where we had um, different um, versions of an ABLT word list. And at baseline, version A was administered. At immediate post-training just um, about uh, six weeks later, everybody tanked. Both the control group and the people who were trained on memory did really bad. But that's because version B of the, of the ABLT was much more dif difficult than version A. People went down even further. So we have this interesting roller coaster ride. By the time at visit five, about three years into the study, when version A was administered again, we see that there was an improvement, but that was masked by form effects. So. Um, we, we, we implemented um, mean equating, linear equating, and equipercentile equating in, in, in different ways to try to smooth out these form effects. And linear equating and equipercentile equating all did a pretty good job. So, um, you know, w when I talk about approaches for, for, um, for test equating, um, it's not like you're, you're, you, you either have to use a distribution-based method or an IRT-based method. In the, in the um, BP-COG study that Emily talked about, when we had these different, this problem of these different versions of the DSST, ultimately, we wanted to use latent variables for our, for our equating approach, but we really wanted the digit symbol substitution to be a common item linking these data sets, because these common anchor items are really valuable. So we used echo percentile equating to equate the scores across the different versions um, between Eric's last CHS and Cardius last Mesa and Nomos, which used the um, simple digit task. 
And when we used, so um, there are a couple dangers of distribution-based methods. These are blunt force tools. They not only can erase form and version differences, but they also obliterate age differences. They obliterate demographic differences that we may wish to preserve. The, the, the resolution to that um, that, 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 um, that we often do uses either sample restriction or covariate adjustment, where you restrict your sample to a, to a horribly biased subgroup, maybe people who are aged in the active study, people who are aged like maybe um, 70 to 75, a narrow age range that's observed at all time points, and we, we only use people from, from, um, um, from certain um, characteristics. We derive our equating algorithm. If it's linear equating, that means collect the mean and the standard deviation from that bias subgroup, and then apply the equating algorithm to the full sample. And it's, it's also, you know, it's important. Um, so we can use um, covariate adjustment to preserve um, other things that we, differences that we want to preserve. Um, another, another danger is that you want to really think carefully about, carefully about what you want to equate. Is there sufficient variability to support the relative position, to support that mean and that standard deviation or those percentiles that, that, that we're using? You need variables that have variability. You want to make sure that you're equating measures of the same construct. So you don't want to have equate measures that have um, different meanings. So, um, you know, after, after, we, after I learned a lot about echo percentile equating, um, my boss sent me this table where he equated MMSE scores with shoe size in the mobilized Boston study. So what this suggests is that among people with an MMSC less than 24, the maximum equated shoe size is 7. So we can use a shoe size of 7 as an index potentially for cognitive impairment. You have to make sure that you're... That you, equating is a numbers exercise. What we have to do is make sure that um, these things are on... Um, that these things are, mean the concept, conceptually the same thing. And that's why we have to involve our experts. So I think we'll, we'll, we can talk about these things later. And that's all. Thank you.